Hello viewer and welcome to Take on Tech. Uh, Take on Tech is a program that comes to you uh, on KBC Channel 1 every Thursday at this time. And uh, in this program, we talk about tech issues, we unpack them, we simplify them uh, with a panel of experts. You can engage with us on our social media handles. And before I introduce my panelists, I would like to take you over to Jane to give us our handles. Jane. Welcome once again to Take On Tech. My name is Jenna Roy. As always, we are glad you are with us this evening. As for mentioned tonight, we continue with the discussion that was started last week all about fintech and the opportunities that lay within Kenya and in Africa as a whole. And of course, we'll also be looking at some of your <coughs> feedback, the questions, the comments, or the clarifications that you sent through, as well as the ones that you are going to be sending through today. Official communication platforms ever remain open. The official hashtag for this program is Take On Tag. KBC Television, tag me and my colleague at Jane Mumboy and... You can also send us a message. The number is 20154. And we'd love to address you by your name uh, when you, we read your messages. So do include your name and let us know where you're watching us from. And for those who you know who cannot have access to a TV, you can let them know that they can stream us live. Uh, just go to our website. That is www.kbc.co.ke hyphen KBC Live. And you'll be able to catch us live and direct as we proceed on with this discussion. But for now, back to you, Grace, to get started with this discussion. Thank you, Jean. Um, fintech opportunities in Kenya and in Africa. Welcome to part two. Last week, we looked at what the definition of fintech is, and we agreed that it's the use of technology to deliver financial services to consumers and to businesses. We also looked at uh, why fintech uh, has developed in Kenya. And it's because there's lots of info, uh, innovation and uh, we have those spaces that allow people to innovate. We also looked at uh, the future of fintech uh, and though we didn't go um, in, uh, in detail, so we'll be looking at some of those opportunities. We also looked at some of the challenges, uh, for example, the issue of data mining, which has been happening in the absence of a law, but we now have a data protection law, so we don't know, you know, it will be interesting to look at how this game is going to unfold. We also looked at the issue of uh, protection of consumers, and so today we specifically want to focus on what opportunities exist uh, in the fintech uh, area. And so uh, I would like to introduce my panel of experts, uh, same uh, panel that was there last week. And I would like to start with, uh, on my immediate left, Ali Hussein. Ali Hussein is a co-founder and CEO of Kipochi, uh, which is a fintech. I would then go to Mary Mwangi, uh, Karibu Mary. Mary Santa. is the CEO of Data Integrated Limited. And then we have George Jeroge, who is the CEO of East Africa Data Handlers. Karibu Nisana. I think we will go straight into, into the topic. Now, um, last week we were just discussing about uh, fintech and how people are borrowing, how people are lending using uh, the financial technology. Uh, we noted that there is that element of finances, but today we want to look at what are other use cases for fintech, so that then it just doesn't look like it's a money uh, idea. And uh, Ali, kick us off. Great, thanks, uh, Grace. So, um, you know, I guess the first thing that people talk about when we're talking about fintech, you're talking about mobile money, you're talking about uh, banking transactions, but let's also look at other use cases. So let's look at insurance, for example. <coughs> now, um, just a bit of background. When you look at insurance in this country, it's less than 3% penetration rate. Um, um, within the country and a lot of insurance is sort of looked at as a statutory thing to do because if you don't have your car insurance you know you're going to be stopped by police um, 
So issuer tech is becoming an interesting conversation to have. Um, you have a number of established players uh, that are already looking and already launching products in the, insu you know, in the insurance sector to, uh, to try and address the low penetration rate of insurance. But you also have some very interesting startups that, for example, did you know today you could actually get your car insurance without leaving your office? without calling a broker. How is that? <clears throat> the same way you use M-Pesa. Uh, it's an app. Uh, <clears throat> you fill in your details for your car. Uh, you take a photo of your car. Uh, you, take a, uh, you send you know, a copy of the logbook, uh, and you get an estimate. You make payment online, and you get your insurance ticket delivered to your office or to your home. So that's one other use case for, uh, for, fin uh, you know, for fintech. Another one is <coughs> investments. It's a very interesting uh, startup uh, here called Abacus that has connected um, all the data from the Nairobi Stock Exchange and other in, you know, investment vehicles, and you can make investments on your mobile phone. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so... Uh, so sorry, mm, um, mm. I, I'm just trying to understand. Uh, you make... So they give you investment options, mm, mm -hmm. what they can offer. They give you investment options, they give you the potential returns, uh, and all that. And in fact, even Safaricom has just launched, uh, I think last week, a product called Mali. Uh, where you save on, on almost a daily basis and they tell you what your interest is going to be. So things are evolving. Uh, things are evolving. Um, but we are, also, we, are, we are seeing, in this space, we are seeing a lot more of the, what is known as startups. Uh, so uh, new companies that are coming on with new technology, uh, to uh, to sort of disrupt a certain sector, <clears throat> but let's not also forget that um, you have current players in the banking sector that are also that have also launched fintechs. <clears throat> and the thing about the financial sector is sometimes I get the feeling that the more things change, the more they remain the same. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you look at KCB, they have VUMA, <coughs> which is a fintech within, um, within the bank. <coughs> if you look at Equity Bank, they have FinSAP, which is within uh, the bank. Uh, you look at uh, CBA, now NCBA, after the merger with NIC. They have NBV, uh, New Business Ventures, which is where I'm sure is housed. Uh, CBA Loop, which is a sort of digital bank. Okay. Um, and then Barclays Bank also has Timiza, which is a mobile lending uh, platform. But they also offer insurance inside there. They also offer savings. So things are evolving. Okay. Uh, George, last week uh, before we, you know, before we went away, we... Um, you did mention something to do with tea farmers mm -hmm. and knowing that this country relies heavily on agriculture. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe you want to tell us more about how fintech then is, uh, is, uh, is either influencing or changing that particular sector. Okay. So I think one of the things that we observe, I think that we pointed out is that fintech is using technology to do largely financial services. But as Ali has pointed out, it's gone beyond financial services. And if you try and look at banking as an example, banking started off as the old way of keeping money. I think today when I was coming, I was trying to remember how my old grandfather used to take money for him at the post, uh, postal corporation. And I'd only, they only had a book and they would record his deposits. And the way they would do it is very simple. Go, 
you they ask his name you put his name you put in the money you're putting and he could never bank into a different branch unless his branch as until because there was no technology of moving that particular card that was holding his deposit until now technology came along technology made it possible for him to come and become dependent on the same same bank but because he trusted it one of the things that you will observe about banking and financial services for so many years it's been built on the credibility of the bank and 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 as a key observation you must realize that the old players have been the most rigid at moving the old players in the banking sector as an example have been the most rigid at moving and in adopting technology and i'm new players now have come in and brought in very emerging technology to bring the context home we are saying that that credibility has moved to what is called utility the utility value is where you're looking at if for instance today i look at a commercial bank as an example i don't relate with them in relation to how well uh, the, the ladies at the bank serve me or how well i am happy with the bank and how much i trust the bank i use it for utility value so if the internet banking infrastructure is running there are uh, way where they deliver services to me uh, uh, where i do no longer now need the bank to physically uh, receive banking services then i am more happy to rely on them now that is where the future is headed but it's going further now and affecting other sectors starting with an example of of um, uh, tea farming where you have more than 50,000 farmers farming uh, tea how do you ensure that their bonuses and their payments are made on time how do you ensure that the service delivery that is being offered by them uh, to the uh, to, to the to the tea and, and delivery uh, entity ensures that these farmers are also made to understand there are more additional services in built on technology they can be given to ensure they can do beyond now the actual delivery of tea he'll receive money on technology he'll disperse and and be able to be notified his grading of his teas using technology and that is where the future is headed because the challenge that we have in emerging opportunities is that when the old players refuse to enter into that space they end up being replaced by new players who are responding to the utility requirements of the customer because the customer of today is a customer of here and now i want to be able to receive the services that i'm looking at now and if technology does not serve the customer the customer will fail and will not be able to be dependent on such uh, such service providers okay we'll come back to <coughs> that question of uh, opportunities for emerging markets sure. in the fintech yeah. uh, area but uh, address you know like that ordinary farmer yeah you know uh, how farmers have suffered because of either um, payments have been delayed sure. or uh, they were expecting this amount of money and they In got income. less so is fintech a solution for yes, the it tea is. farmer and, and and amazingly it it goes beyond just being a solution it addresses the the big, the major uh, opportunities that are there there's a there's a company that is um, that uh, is interacting with uh, for a lot of farmers uh, that largely does what you call satellite pictures of the ground itself and the productivity of grounds and integrates that with the productivity of the of the farmer over the years and takes that as part of the artificial intelligence and and and, and, and machine learning and tells the farmer there's a likelihood that your yield will increase or decrease based on all these possibilities and with all this possibility there's a likelihood that your uh, your 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 bushes will produce within this level so you are able to predict your productivity and your income not only now based on you just waking up in the morning and believing that today my 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 bushes will produce but there's a clear observance from satellite pictures that are being provided to yourselves as a farmer and from possibilities now being now provided real time information that is there one of the most amazing things that technology brings is the future the data capability analytics and machine learning because without analytics and machine learning a lot of us will not be able to see the future
Because the future is based on what? What has happened in the past and plausibly being able to tell exactly what tomorrow will hold on exactly how the future has been. And that is what we call machine learning in okay. simple English. Correct. Um, we are going to come back to that question. Okay. Okay. Uh, but just to now, Mary, dovetail into what both Ali and uh, uh, George have pointed out. Uh, we see a lot of changes happening. And um, would you, are there ways in which fin fintech is, say, changing the way ordinary women do business? I think um, there is a lot of it. And uh, like uh, George has said, if you look at farming, when a woman takes her produce to the market, just knowing, is it increasing? Is it decreasing? Um, there is now statistical data to actually tell you what's really happening on the ground. And just not um, to talk about just the woman herself. Yesterday, I was looking when the results came out for you know, the, the people who finished Form 4. And here there was data where, which was tracking the number of students that did the <coughs> exam at the <coughs> class 8 level. And then it goes on to show how many of them did the exams at the Form 4 level per county. I've never seen that data before. Now, here is actionable data that actually you can act on. It had the number of women or girls <coughs> that actually did the exam and how many of them now made it to Form 4. And we lost a lot of students in there. So now you can see where technology has actually enabled the government, the parents, to actually look and see what is going on. The same thing is happening to the farmers also. You can start looking at what was the yield this year. Why are these women yield going down. Last year they were able to bring this much tea uh, coming from a tea farming area. Uh, I remember when they had the little books and you get a statement at the end of the month, but now you don't need to do all that. They actually have a system where they're able to tell you how much tea you've brought in. <coughs> You're also able to see which market. I think there's a couple of fintechs that are actually able to tell you what the price is at the market. And so you know when to actually go and sell, where you can actually sell, what are the opportunities. Some of the brokers sometimes will take advantage of the women not knowing what the price is at the market, and so they would give them lower prices. But now you can easily check through an SMS on your phone the cost of what uh, your goods at the local market. I think um, the fintech that we are talking about, even though sometimes it's at the very low level, it's just an SMS, it does serve the purpose. It doesn't have to be super complex. I think we need to look at it as in the movement of data at the right time to the, at the right place too. And that is what enables people to make decisions. And I think fintech in Kenya has done quite a good job in bringing this. Can I, can I add on to that? Um, uh, so if you look at the farm level, the majority of farmers in Africa are smallholder farmers, small-scale farmers. The biggest problem is access to funding, to financing. Um, so if we, if we sort of roll it down to Kenya, Kenya's GDP, I believe 36% to 37% is from farming. Sure. But if you look at the, um, the market share that agriculture gets from uh, funding from financial institutions, it's less than 10%. So there's a huge discrepancy between what the country can actually do from an agricultural perspective uh, and what the financial uh, services sector is doing to actually uplift the farmer. 
But if you ask uh, the financial services sector, the problem is usually about data, as George has sort of uh, alluded to. So how do you bridge that gap? So let me give you a scenario. We have had horror stories about dairy farmers pouring milk. And yet, there are certain parts of this country that don't have enough milk. Okay? So that's an infrastructure conversation, which is not part of our discussion today. today you're right. But those same farmers, if they deliver their milk to, say, a cooperative depot, the, the, the lag from the time when they are delivering the milk to the time when they get paid, they can't afford to wait for 30, 60 days. They just simply can't afford. This is where you know, FinTech comes in. Uh, simple technology, uh, you know, appropriate technology. You deliver your milk, you get an SMS, immediate SMS, saying you have delivered your milk, and this is the liters you've delivered, that system can be connected to a financial institution or a SACO. Remember, SACOs play a major role in this country. Saying so and so farmer has delivered 100 liters of milk. The farmer gets an alert. You've delivered milk. Would you like some money against your yeah, delivery against your delivery this is just sms yes you would like some money go into this ussd access your money immediately uh, you know if you want to complicate it you can call it invoice financing but the farmer doesn't give a hoot whether whatever <laughs> you are whether you're calling it invoice financing or not all he or she wants is money at that time when he's delivering He's even happy to discount it a bit because it's, it's a time value of money. Those are the opportunities when it comes to how you bridge fintech and agriculture. So the term that we should be using today is agritech. Agri can, can I add something? Yes, George, you want to add? Just, just a quick one. Yeah. And tell you that our biggest challenge in the adoption and implementation of technology, as I've seen it, it is our lack of reliance on data. And, and, and in my honest opinion, the biggest opportunity there is in fintech is digitizing and, and, and producing data that will help decision makers make decisions. I recently was trying to do a research for um, an entity that was trying to look at what is the percentage of CEOs that make decisions based on data and accuracy? And 90% of us, and, I, and I'm guilty as, as, as amongst the 90, we make decisions on Thumb fancy suck. numbers and uh, my, my so-called experience as a CEO, but I don't depend on data. I today was meeting somebody who was telling me that, as an example, a lot of the people that are we are seeing an emergence of, of, of quick loan uh, mobile lending applications. Some of the new startups that are coming in on mobile lending are closing business within three to four months. Why? Because they depend on data to lend to you, but they, they have not built mechanisms to additionally build a new data to understand that George or Ali is indebted to this level to these other guys. And without that data, they make a decision on one facet of data that ends up giving them significant losses because you find that people tell you, and this can be done, um, they have lent, they bor borrowed from three, four uh, lending apps. Right. And they are indebted to them. So I say data drives decision making. If we have to reach that very future that we are looking at, uh, Can I, just ask? Um, I, I think the issue of data uh, is very interesting, and uh, I think we, we, we need to discuss that mm. in relation to fintech and how Absolutely. organizations are, are, are doing it. Uh, but before we continue, we just want to hear um, uh, Jane, do you have any feedback from us? 
from uh, social media. Yes, we definitely do. The hashtag is Take on Tech on Twitter. And let me just start with one tweet here from Busara, from Busara Center, which says, there is fear of some sort between the fintech space and regulators, and that fear needs to end so that fintech can thrive in Kenya, Africa, and beyond borders. Then uh, it goes on to say, in order to help this come to life, we need a smart regulation. It is the key to the financial inclusion momentum that is slowly but surely taking root here in our country. We have Kawera, let me quickly get that, Kawera who says, um, when it comes to behavioral economics, how does it link to financial inc inclusion and how can it impact fintech here in the country? All right. We also have, uh, let us quickly move on to uh, uh, the other hashtag right here. Um, Let's get as far back as uh, from ja Jirani's food actually says, um, agreeing with George Jiroga, you know, future bankers will be br uh, will become programmers. This, this is a tweet from last week. We're also summing up some of the feedback that you sent last week. And he goes on to say, you, we need to discuss cloud computing technology and the benefits it, uh, it brings to modern businesses. All right. We now move on to other tweets we have here. Uh, Twahir Kasim, who is asking, um, with this move into fintech and the rise in cybercrime and our unpreparedness to combat it, how do we ensure that Wanjiko buys in? One last one, he uh, goes on to ask, you know, reference your touch on AI in relation to fintech. How do we reconcile the fear of machine taking over and harnessing the power of machine? Again, the fear between regulation, fintech, and also it, you know, replacing human uh, resources. That's it for this. Uh, as of now, the hashtag still is a take on tech. Keep them coming in. We will be sampling them as and when they do come in. Back to you, Grace. Oh, thank you so much for those of us who are following us and giving us feedback. The issue of regulation we must deal with, but uh, let's, let's first deal with what uh, we were discussing before we took a break. Now, the issue of uh, digital uh, identity, the issue of data, uh, <coughs> data in use of uh, you know, mining, yeah. data mining, so that then you are able to tell what sort of customer you have. And, uh, you know, digital, somebody uh, did comment and said that digital identity is becoming the new money. Mm. Uh, so what are the implications of this? Uh, when we look at, for example, FB and Facebook, uh, they've also moved into payments and digital identity then has become part of that uh, uh, forex or foreign exchange. Um, Mary, do you want to give us a comment? Yeah, I think uh, when we come to digital identity, I think it's very crucial for any fintech industry to really take off. And some of the things that can be actually helpful is to have a common identity. There is, a big, there is some talk of having a financial identity that runs across countries and actually global. So this would also help some of the issues we're seeing in lending because with one digital identity, you would actually be able to track that person across the different platforms. So currently, with us not having one unified identity, then you're finding that people can jump from one platform, borrow from one lender, go to the next lender, and then there is no sharing of data across the board. If you look at uh, how many people are utilizing the um, reporting system that we have for credit check, if, say, I lent to you and then I actually reported that I have lent to you, you have an outstanding loan. Then Ali also lends to you, then he reports. It becomes very easy for sharing data across the platform. This is one big problem we actually have across most of, Af or most of the African countries is the lack of data, lack of sharing of data. And like you're saying, we have not built the infrastructure that's required for fintech to really operate at a higher level. Okay. Yes, we'll have many players and some will suffer because of some of these. And um, I think the regulators are also looking to see how this can be achieved 
to protect not just the lenders and the businesses, but also to protect the consumers themselves um, just by having like standardized laws around a common digital identity. I, I think you've raised uh, the issue because I just wanted to, uh, I'll come back to you to find out whether we really need standardization and why. Uh, I know you wanted to comment. So I think one thing that we sort of must appreciate is that the growth of fintech has foundational has its foundations with data that has been available that established players have not until very recently been actually using that so the, f the reason why the tellers and the branches and the emsuaries and the KCB M-Pesas can lend you money without you ever seeing them or without ever walking into a branch uh, is simply because today there is, there is some level of digital identity they can actually verify. All right, so if I, if I am on branch today, if I go to branch, I verify using, say, IPRS. Which, What's IPRS? Okay, IPRS is, is a, I forget the... Just explain the CR system. It is a government yeah. system that verifies your identity to your name, to your mobile number, and stuff like that. So you query that system, all right? And, and these systems are sort of have their origin with the credit reference bureaus, the CRBs. Now, before CRBs were sort of very reactive, all right? Uh, a bank will ask for your credit check, your credit report, so if you're asking for my credit report of last month and I've already taken four or five mobile loans, how the hell is that helping you? Okay, as, as a bank or as a fintech. So today you have organizations, you have credit reference bureaus, for example, uh, one that I know that does this well, what they call decisioning, uh, credit info. What they do is they collect all this data and they look at Ali and say, Ali has six loans from all these mobile lending platforms. He is paying them diligently, but there is one he's not paying. So you as a, as a fintech or as a bank, you look at that profile and all this is automated by the way. Mm -hmm. It's fully automated. That so they'll give you a report. Is it what George referred to? It as is what George is referring to. It is what George is referring to. So you've got players today that are already moving forward okay. and m really moving fast to actually address the pain points of the industry. And uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, let's face it, guys. Uh, the issue of financial inclusion is sort of uh, overlaps with uh, overlending. So there is a conversation around regulation and self-regulation and policy, which is another matter that I would like to sort of touch on uh, All right. as uh, we get back to yeah. this. The, um, one, of, uh, one of the questions that has been raised in social media um, has been about regulation. And I'm um, just wondering whether there is a way to effectively uh, regulate uh, fintech or whether it is necessary. So uh, I think let George comment okay. and then we can come back here. Well, <coughs> I am not pro regulations. I am a, I'm a believer of very many things. And I, and I give an example of mobile money that. If you look at Nigeria and Kenya as an example, um, Nigeria went to move, moved fast to regulate mobile money 
verses in Kenya where the government let it run, <coughs> then regulated it at a, at a later stage when they technically understood the entire animal from all sides. If you look at a blind man and uh, you make them touch an elephant, and one will touch the ears, and uh, someone will say an elephant is a big uh, meat that is lightened, uh, maybe very slender, and that's an elephant. One will touch a tusk and they will, <laughs> they will have a whole different picture. And the one who touches the tail thinks that an elephant and a snake are all the same size. But you and me know who have seen the whole elephant is a completely different animal from the different facets that we look at it from. So moving quickly and regulating uh, fintech would really derail the entire industry and will not allow the technology to uh, blossom and to allow for it to do amazing things that it can do. And, and the future of fintech is not in regulation. It is in letting it become itself. Then at a later stage now look at it and say, how do we fix certain issues that are there? So the players should be thinking of self-regulation. Well, uh, that is a cardinal principle in success of anything. An example is how uh, uh, social media uh, accounts are managed by their players who decide to banish certain individuals who do certain, break certain policies. An example within FitTech that they need to find a solution and quickly is an example of data sharing, where if you cannot be able to share data within the different FinTechs, and they have had uh, CRBs that are the center of, of, of that data, but how reliable is our data in decision making at a point in which you're making certain decisions, yet the movability of the paths are very high. Now, a question somebody asked on, on, on cloud computing that they brought in the aspect of big data. And they said, uh, uh, we keep hearing big data, big data. But nobody has, maybe to break it down in simple English. Mm -hmm. Big data is data that appears in different forms. So it's defined as with maybe four Vs. It is variety. So it is different types. So we have maybe pictures, we have text messages, we have um, videos that exist in different forms. And structure. And then you have data that is a lot. That is called in volume. Data means you can't make a decision whether as by the time maybe you, you get this data, the next data has come. Uh, and people use the example of how much data we've generated in the last 10 years is more data than the data that was generated since the innovation of the earth. 10 years, what we've generated in the last 10 years is far better than, far bigger than what was generated uh, since the world began. Then there is data that, that is in doubt. You are not sure whether to depend on it to make decisions and all that. So big data comprises on all these to try and make certain decisions. And all this influence how quickly we are able to make certain decisions to influence our success of all these technologies that we are implementing. Okay. Yes. Um, Ali, you had wanted, uh, but uh, yeah. I think uh, quickly because we, we are running out of time and I would like Mary to speak about my, standardization. <clears throat> my sense around policy and regulation is sort of different from uh, my brother George. Um, first, let me say not everything needs to be regulated, for sure. But let me also say one thing. There used to be three things that were a given in life. You were born, you must pay your taxes, and you must die one day. Please add a fourth one, regulation. Whether we like it or not. And the reason why is that governments worldwide are getting flat-footed. They are getting, you have uh, the big tech companies that we've talked about, the Googles, the Facebooks, and the Amazons, who in some cases have run roughshod over not just other companies, but in some cases countries. I mean, you've, you've had the problems that the US have, has had with Facebook, which is its own, you know, its own uh, part of the, the country. But let me say one thing. 
from an industry perspective, we must have a seat at the table when policymakers are discussing issues around our industry. Because the analogy is very simple. If you are not at the table eating with others, you're on the menu. Okay. <laughs> so okay. you, we must engage. Before you get regulated, yeah. you must create those rules. And that's how you engage with policymakers. I think that's really important to, to point out. Okay, we need to close, but uh, Mary, please, in, in like half a second, uh, just make a comment on the issue of standardization um, in regards to fintech. I think uh, when we talk about fintechs and we're talking about standards, they're going to vary depending on the industry. But I do believe that if we put proper standards, then it helps like the standards of how do we share the data. We are sharing information. What type of standards should this information meet? How is it being collected? Where is it being stored? What rules are there across the whole, um, I'd say the continent? Then that helps us collect data more. It helps us also work with it. And it will also help us to digitize and automate the small businesses that will be <coughs> able to plug in much <coughs> easier. And for anyone wanting to come in and create a tech business, then they will have something to guide them. Okay. Um, that's it for today. Take on tech, uh, fintech opportunities in Kenya. Uh, thank you very much, our panelists, uh, Ali Kasim Hussein, uh, George Joroge, and uh, Mary. We, we, we are actually very happy that you have been able to expound and we have uh, listened to different issues, data mining, uh, innovation, uh, what needs to be done and we hope that Kenyans have learned something. I now take you over to Jane. My name is Grace Gidaiga. Well, with that, we want to call it a discussion, but thank you so much for being with us and to, uh, sharing with us your views and feedback in regards to this discussion. Remember to join us again every other Thursday right here on KBC Channel 1 from 7.30 to 8.30 for nothing but the best when it comes to matters to do with tech. My name is Jim Ramboy. Do enjoy the rest of your viewing. Good evening and good night.